Well, thank you, Dr. Kleinrock. A short time ago, I had the distinct pleasure to meet Len for the first time, and he was gracious enough to invite me to this grand celebration. Now, he asked me to speak about DARPA, DARPA then and DARPA now, but as we've heard so many times today, it's really about the people. So I could talk about DARPA then and DARPA now, or I could talk about the people, the so-called icons of science who made it all happen. Now, as Len said, I am indeed the director of DARPA, but I can tell you that the title director has very different meaning in Washington, D.C. than it does here in L.A. And this morning, it caused a little bit of confusion. You see, the D.C. staff told the team here in L.A. that the director was arriving and she needed to be prepped. So at 5.15 this morning, a personal stylist showed up at my hotel. <laughs> now, usually in my world, two colonels show up. And I can tell you that things look a lot different when the colonels are done with me. So we have two choices. We're either going to have to teach Autumn how to do an intel brief, or we're going to have to teach the colonels how to choose just the right color of lipstick. <laughs> OK, which brings me to my point, really, about the icons of science. What many people don't realize is that science is an inherently creative activity. Much like television, much like the movies, much like other forms of art. Now, the problem, perhaps, might be that our image leaves a little to be desired. In fact, our style icons are perhaps a bit underappreciated. Now, for well more than 40 years, our style icons have been charting new territory at the farthest edges of style outer space. So, the good news is, though, that women are going to save the day. The women of science are going to save the day. From Marie Curie's early Nobel work to Elizabeth Neufeld's National Medal of Science work, they break new grounds of discovery. But they also have changed the image of science. From Fred Sears's Earth versus the flying saucers, where they were making coffee, to today, where they are not only in charge, but they are smoking hot. <laughs> so that is progress, real progress. Now, the style icons of science still have their challenges. They're just different challenges. In Larson's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, or the girl who played with fire, a profoundly eccentric, sexy woman with an immeasurable IQ solves Fermat's conjecture while simultaneously being stalked by a homicidal Crimean. Now that's a real challenge. And it is a far cry from making coffee. Now, I'm sure we could talk about science style icons for a while. We could talk about them then and now. But it's never really been about what scientists and engineers wear, thankfully. Rather, it's been about what they discover. That's what makes them cool. And today, that's what we're here to talk about. The iconic discovery, a singularity of our time, the internet, then and now. So that first challenge, what we are here today to celebrate, 
those humble beginnings some 40 years ago, a seemingly simple goal, connect two remote nodes together, one at UCLA, one at SRI. Simple, yet profound. The result, we've heard about it today, two letters, an L and an O. The first two letters, of the word login, and then a buffer overrun crashes the system. The good thing that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> well, apparently we still have a little bit of work to do. Um, well, despite that rocky start to that early conversation, which is very common in new languages, those first two letters and other companion efforts gave birth to what we now know as the internet. The creation of the then called ARPANET was the result of brilliant work. It was performed here at UCLA, at Stanford, at UC Santa Barbara, at the University of Utah, MIT, and in other places. And the reality today is that the internet is like a new life. It is organic, it is changing, it is growing, it's unique, and it is spectacular. From such humble beginnings, something that has profoundly affected us all. It's really inherently beautiful. Science is art. It is the creation of something new, something that never existed before. And it challenges us all to think about ourselves, about others, about ethics, about the future. So, what's next? At DARPA, we don't really have the luxury of admiring past discoveries because we have a lot of work ahead of us, new challenges. Our charge, our responsibility, is to continue to push the future, to continue to push forward, and to seek those big, high-risk, high-payoff activities. So we asked ourselves, what's next? Well, what if we took up a challenge? And that challenge was to realize just how powerful the internet had become. So today, I'd like to announce that challenge. In December of this year, 10 very large balloons will fly in the continental US. For two days, during daylight hours, they will be visible. The first person or team to correctly identify all the locations and describe how they did it wins. The prize, $40,000. Payable to the person, the team, the organization, or donated to charity. 40 years later, $40,000 to find out just how powerful is this network. So, we thought we'd take a look as to how one might have accomplished it before. Well, in 1969, in order to stage or participate in such a challenge, you would need to know the owner of a newspaper a radio station, or a TV network. And once you saw a balloon, you would have to be a trained navigator using a sextant in order to figure out the exact location. Remember, this is 1969, no GPS. And it would have been expensive. In 1969, a phone call from Washington, D.C., 
to Denver, Colorado costs 45 cents per minute. In today's dollars, that's $6.60 per minute. And how would we do it today? Well, today, individuals with their own smarts are empowered to make information go viral. They can work in teams with people they know and people they have never met. The process has been democratized. It is practically free to participate and access is widespread. That it what is what was first started 40 years ago. That then was an internet challenge. Today, it is a network challenge. So, I invite you to read more about it on our website or follow the challenge on Twitter. Okay. Now, I can't leave today without talking about how serious the times are that we live in. These are indeed serious times, and they require the absolute best of all of us. The breadth of threats is vast. The challenges are intense. And when the problems are great, the tendency for each of us is to step away. Because we believe, even hope, that someone else, perhaps smarter, perhaps with more resources, will solve those very difficult problems. But I have found that those imaginary people do not exist. There isn't someone else. It is people just like you and me. They step up. They believe in something important, and then they set out to make it so. It is at once extremely difficult and very simple. They believe in something, and then they make it so. This year in Science Magazine, Bill Wool and Anita Jones wrote about the call of service. They wrote, our premise is that every engineer and every scientist ought to include service to their country in their career path. Everyone has a contribution to make. Shouting from the sidelines does not work. It is not enough. There are no imaginary people to do this hard work. There is no backup plan. What's your contingency plan? Contingency plan? Your backup plan. You gotta have some kind of backup plan, right? No, we don't have a backup plan. This is it. And this is the best that you could that the, the government, the US government can come up with? I mean, you, you're NASA for crying out loud. You put a man on the moon. You're geniuses. You're, you're the guys that think his shit up. I'm sure you got a team of men sitting around somewhere right now just thinking shit up and somebody backing them up. You tell me you don't have a backup plan and that these eight Boy Scouts right here, that is the world's hope? That's what you're telling me? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Damn it. There is no backup plan. The call to service is ours to answer. Individually, collectively, in our own way, from our own talents, and from our own passions. It's me, and it's you, it's us. Four decades ago, People here today and elsewhere answered that call. For them, the internet in its current version was but a dream, a vision. 
Today, the internet is commerce. The internet is a communal mind. The internet is both vulgar and sublime. It is a reflection of us, the human race, a vast networked mirror that shows us what we are and what we will become. Those early researchers were fueled by the wonder of exploration and the wonder of discovery. And we need that sense of wonder. It fuels our hearts and our minds. It fuels our souls. It renews us. It is the deathless dream, the eternal poetry, and the perennial sense that life is miracle and magic. On behalf of my colleagues at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, I thank you for allowing us to be a part of that wonder. Happy birthday, Internet.